All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We'll get started now. Uh, I hope you're all well. Uh, my name is Larry Helfer. I am a professor here at the law school and co-director of the Center for International and Comparative Law. And on behalf of Dean Abrams, who is unfortunately unable to join us today, I, I would like to welcome you to this year's Herbert L. Bernstein Memorial Lecture in Comparative Law, which is going to be delivered by Finula Nieloin, uh, who I will introduce in a moment. First, I'd like to say that Duke established the Bernstein Lecture in honor of Professor Herbert Bernstein, who taught subjects here at Duke, including conflicts of law, comparative law, international organizations, and European Union law from 1984 until his passing in 2001. He was a much-loved teacher and colleague who, in the words of uh, Professor Paul Hagen, was, quote, a man of great erudition and deep humility. He was funny, irreverent, and insatiably curious about nearly everything. Since the inception of this lecture, numerous renowned scholars, judges, and legal experts have come to Duke from around the world to address a wide range of international and comparative law topics. Previous lectures have included Professor Bernstein's co-author, Joseph uh, Lukowski, Duke Emeritus Professor Donald Horowitz, Israeli Supreme Court Justice Daphna Barak Eretz, and Sundradesh Menon, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Singapore. No event like this can happen without a tremendous amount of support behind the scenes, and so I would very much like to thank, in addition to uh, the support of the Dean's Office and the Center for International and Comparative Law, the communications and IT teams for supporting the lecture, and Monica Robertson and the Dean's Office for her work in coordinating uh, Professor uh, Nee Aloin's uh, visit. This lecture would not also be possible without contributions from Professor Bernstein's friends and from Duke Law alumni. So now let me introduce our distinguished guest. Finula Nealoin is a leading expert in the field of human rights law, as well as feminist theory and international criminal law. She is the Regents Professor and Robina Chair in Law, Public Policy, and Society at the University of Minnesota, where she also serves as the Faculty Director of the Law School's Human Rights Center. She concurrently serves as Professor of Law at Queen's University of Belfast, which is her alma mater. In 2017, Professor Nealoin was, was appointed to the UN Human Rights Council as Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights while Countering Terrorism. She was re-elected for a second three-year term in 2020, uh, and at the end of that term was uh, elected to the International Commission of Jurists. She has had many other roles in the past, uh, including uh, rep as a representative of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, a member of the Irish Human Rights Commission, uh, and chair of the Open Society Foundation's International Women's Program. Professor Nealoin has taught at numerous academic institutions during her career. She's received numerous academic accolades and is the author or co-editor of multiple award-winning books, including The Politics of Force, Law in Times of Crisis, and On the Front Lines of Gender, War, and the Post-Conflict Process. I can think of no one better place to share insights on the important, if sobering, topic of today's lecture the rise of counterterrorism, and the demise of human rights. Please join me in welcoming Professor Nealoin to Duke Law. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Helfner for such a lovely and warm introduction. And I really want to start by acknowledging uh, your former colleague here at the law school, Herbert Bernstein. Um, he was an enormously significant figure in international law. And I particularly want to acknowledge uh, his work uh, in European Union law, which I remember as a young law student reading in Belfast a long time ago. All right. So um, this week, last year, the week starting February the 6th, I, as UN Special Rapporteur, had just started my technical visit to the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. 
Um, I was the first UN expert to have access to that site, including to the detainees. And so it's kind of fitting. I've been spending the last couple of days actually thinking a lot about where we were last year um, and what we encountered. And so it really is an extraordinary opportunity to be here, to be able to stand back and reflect on the bigger picture of the rise of counterterrorism. So 9-11, which was that signature and highly visible terrorist attack, encompassed profound consequences most obviously for the families of the 9-11 uh, victims, many of whom I've come to know personally in the course of the last year in the work I did on this technical visit, but also had a profound consequence for the 779 men and boys, Muslim men and boys, rendered and tortured to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, the 9-11 terrorist attack spawned the so-called War on Terror it signaled and facilitated the growth of kinetic tactics, and it really recalibrated a global consensus on the unacceptability of terrorism. But as this language, this kind of much maligned language on the, quote, war on terror was disavowed, what I want to say and really explore with you today was how a new, what might seem softer form of response emerged, but one which has had an enormous traction from 9-11 onwards. And um, far from having counterterrorism recede as a fundamental plank of state behavior, state uh, uh, regulation, I would argue that counterterrorism has in fact continued to grow, accelerate, and embed over the last two decades. Um, that normative language on sort of war on terror went away, but normative and institutional counterterrorism has institutionalized. And what that has done, in my view, has fundamentally undermined both uh, international human rights and humanitarian law. And uh, this, what um, my colleague Fiona de Londres, a very fam prominent other Irish uh, uh, international law expert, has talked about the growth of these assemblages of counterterrorism institutions. Uh, this growth has remained constant. It is well funded, and it is profoundly accepted and uh, legitimized by states. So I want to start by setting out the normative roadmap for you all. So everybody knows there is no, and I, I don't know how many international, how many international law students do we have in the class? Hands up, yay, okay, lecture, good, all right. So most of you may know, if you've taken international law or not, that we don't have a comprehensive counterterrorism treaty. And um, that has eluded states. It sits kind of dormant in the sixth committee of the UN, and people often talk about the, quote, lack of agreement on treaty norms and counterterrorism. But I want to argue that that lack of an agreement is a strategic, useful, and necessary reality for states. It's not because a definition, a globally agreed definition of terrorism actually eludes us. My mandate and I as Special Rapporteur actually have had a definition that's been broadly used for 20 years. But instead, actually, states want the status quo. They want a lack of definition on terrorism because, most importantly, it allows every single state to define terrorism on their own terms without restraint. It's the perfect gentleman's agreement. Everyone gets to call whomever they like a terrorist with almost no restraint on that definitional capacity at the national level. The second thing uh, I want to say normatively is that something really significant shifts after 9-11. And that is what is both a normative change, but also an institutional change. And the change is the role of the UN Security Council. So in response to the events of 9-11, the UN Security Council moves very quickly, acting under Chapter 7. And what it's done since 9-11 is issue sweeping and important what a number of us international law scholars have described as legislative enactments on the prevention and response to terrorism. 
And so what the Security Council has done is essentially entrenched a particular set of obligations for states to prevent and to suppress terrorism. And I think what this aligns with is an increasingly important lawmaking function that is being carried out by international organizations more broadly, but in particular by the Security Council. And my concern has been, both as a scholar but as a practitioner of international law, is that that, um, that lawmaking role impinges on the legitimate sovereignty of states as the primary movers of law. It may, and I think in the context of counterterrorism, what it does is that it overrides and impinges on national constitutions and legislative protections for human rights. And what it does is really exclude the possibility of debate among states, among civil society, among other stakeholders on what should be the appropriate safeguards for the rule of law and human rights in the context of countering terrorism. The resolutions adopted by the Council are characterized by a number of common elements. And, you know, one of the things about being special rapporteur is you sort of get to watch the sausage being made close up, good and bad. And so I want to start by saying one of the things we often say about the Security Council, and right now if you think about Ukraine or Israel, Gaza, you'll say, Security Council is pretty dysfunctional, can't, can't agree on things. But I want to suggest that that's really a far too simplistic analysis of what's actually happening at the Security Council. Because if you go one layer down, and if you look at what the Security Council has been doing specifically in the area of counterterrorism over the last uh, two decades, what you'll see is enormous, consistent unanimity and actually action by states. So the sort of idea that the Security Council doesn't work, yeah, it doesn't work on some issues. But on some other issues, it works incredibly efficiency, efficiently to serve specific interests of specific states. And so these resolutions are an example of that. And they're characterized by the significant speed of drafting, debate, and agreement on these resolutions. And so a special rapporteur, uh, technically, of course, as a UN human rights expert, you don't sit at the Security Council. But if you're a good expert, what happens is that member states will call you who are on the Council and they'll say, oh, there's this resolution we're thinking or hearing about and what do you think of what's your advice? And often you would get that kind of request with a two to three week timeline. So if you imagine where in treaty making it takes all of this time to move, gain consensus, figure out where the, where the gaps are, and instead what we're getting in counterterrorism is this just fast paced move that often, it's not that just it's moving slowly, but there's no engagement outside of the narrow spa space of the member, member states, no engagement with civil society actors in determining the legal, political, social, and cultural effects of these resolutions solutions. Absolutely, almost not at all. It depends. Sometimes you get a state like Ireland, which was on the Security Council for a while, or a state like Switzerland that's deeply concerned about issues of human rights. But in general, what we see across these resolutions is a lack of benchmarking of accountability for human rights and humanitarian law violations that would follow from the implementation of these Chapter 7 resolutions. And again, the international lawyers will know if it's a Chapter 7 resolution, it's fully binding on a state. It's as hard a law as you can get. It's in, you have to actively implement that. Um, so we see this lack of attention to the disproportionately de detrimental enjoyment of human rights triggered by this very targeted, very, I want to say, I would say ideological small I um, uh, form of terrorism regulation. And finally, most importantly, the mothership here is that because these resolutions lack an agreed and comprehensive definition of terrorism, so the word terrorism is all across these resolutions, but because there's no agreement on the core thing that is being regulated, states and re regional organizations are left to craft their own definitions of who is a terrorist to whom these things apply with a wide variety of groups, persons, and activities being targeted by these counterterrorism regimes. I'm just going to use two examples. Xinjiang, China. Um, I think about uh, the democratic opposition in countries like Turkey. 
Uh, think about environmental activists in countries like Guatemala. All of these things, if we look at the national implementation of these uh, resolutions, get caught up because they're entirely dependent on who the national legal system defines as a terrorist. So that's the general problem of these resolutions, but we have, I want to talk about a few of them in particular to sort of give you a sense of the nitty gritty of it. The most significant resolution is UN Security Council Resolution 1373, passed literally as the ash is still smoldering at the south end of, uh, of, of Manhattan, and the Security Council is sitting in emergency session, essentially. And so this resolution is extraordinary wide in its obligations that it places on states. And um, what the resolution does is that it requires states to criminalize terrorist activities, to freeze financial assets of terrorism or those participating in terrorist acts, to ban others from access to funds, to deny safe havens to persons or groups engaged in terrorism. And um, the council says you have to bring terrorists to justice. You have to institute effective counter uh, border security measures. And you have to stop terrorists moving um, to make sure that there's no proliferation. So in principle, none of those things are bad things. And I, as a human rights lawyer, I want to say security is a human right. It's embedded in the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. The most basic thing most people want in their lives is security in order to have access to other rights. So at that level, none of these things are objectionable. The problem is when it's unmoored from a definition of who is a terrorist, we leave it up to states to decide. And those states are often backsliding democracies, authoritarian regimes, states who have little interest in a narrowly tailored definition of terrorism. Because post 9-11, many, many states saw an incredible opportunity in counterterrorism to do work that they could not otherwise do domestically with the legitimacy and imprimatur of international law. So 1373 kind of spawns or kicks off this process of normative change. But it comes with two, I think, other patterns. One is we get us after 1373, it's kind of a running joke on the Security Council, because when new states come in, one of the things most states want, not the permanent five who get their moments of glory all the time, but new states coming in want a win. And what's a win on the Security Council? A win is often a landmark Security Council resolution where your foreign minister or your head of state gets to sit at the top of the Security Council and hit the gavel as everybody agrees. What was your most likely win in the Security Council on resolutions between 2001 and the present? a counterterrorism resolution. Because you could be more or less guaranteed if you came up with a half reasonable idea, you would get it. So I'm not going to walk through all of the resolutions we've had since 2001, but it's just to, to sort of underscore the acceleration from 2001 and, and 17, 1373 onwards. Um, in 2014, we get another development, which is that um, as the Islamic State starts to take over large parts of Iraq and Syria, the Security Council and certain member states led by the United States become seized of what they see as not just a specific local threat to two countries, but a broader regional threat and, a, a, if you want, a global threat. And we get a series of resolutions, uh, one starting 2170 in 2014, 2178, and 2396 in 2017. And this is, I think, a sort of a second stage of this legislative uh, sort of use of counterterrorism resolutions. Um, and I want to just stress a couple of things about this shift to these resolutions in 2014. The focus on these resolutions is on this particular area. But what states, and particularly the United States and European states, the WIOGs are interested in, is preventing people from traveling, from moving out of the Levant into other parts of the world. And I'm not saying, I think of myself as both a security expert and a human rights expert, that's not an illegitimate goal in 2014. 
But it's a little bit of a problem when, in my view, you take what is a localized problem with regional dimensions and create global uh, fiat on uh, travel. And so what we get, for example, with that very first resolution in 2014 is the UN Security Council deciding under a Chapter 7 resolution that every state had the responsibility to collect biometric data on every single person who travels. Now, can you imagine in the United States if we were to put a global biometric data uh, legislative enactment before, the, uh, before Congress? A whole bunch of people would say, that's a problem for reasons of privacy, for reasons of data protection, for reasons of transfer, for reasons of a whole lot of things that do we actually want our most intimate and private data being collected at a mass scale? I know in Ireland, that kind of legislation would simply never have passed. And yet, by Security Council fiat, based on a threat assessment of a particular part of the world, we get a global mandate for all states to collect that biometric data without any human rights language of substance in the resolution and no state disagreeing. And so that's an, that's an example both of this trend of sort of normal, where the council takes on this preeminent role through counterterrorism of legislation and really setting the terms upon which states will regulate these complex issues but also forces us to ask some really fundamental questions about why is the council acting in this way? Is the council ultra vires the UN charter? And see fundamentally where are human rights and other obligations of states when this kind of global scale, normatively consequential regulation is happening. All right. Um, so a couple of trends I take out of these resolutions. One is the scale of norm proliferation. It's difficult to quantify, but in my view, it's really dense if we look at the patterns of state behavior from 2001. Um, second, um, I want to say there's been um, enormous enforcement. <laughs> like for and I, you know, colleagues who work in the human rights field will we often decry the ways in which state don't comply with international law. But it turns out there are some areas of international law where states comply very well. We're over compliance, not under compliance is the problem. And here again, if we look at states' compliance for these resolutions, we see massive movement of state compliance because it serves, in my view, other objectives. All right. The next thing that's happening, we've talked about the lack of definition, I've talked about Security Council resolution. The third thing that's happening in this space at this time is the development of something else called soft law. So soft law, as you know, is kind of an oxymoron. Law is hard. Why do we have soft law? It's a, it's a puzzle of compliance for international lawyers. But I want to say that counterterrorism is one of the areas where soft law has had an enormous and significant um, uh, um, growth spurt. And I didn't, when I became Special Rapporteur, I didn't really fully understand this. I, I went on my first couple of country visits as a Special Rapporteur, a country can invite you to assess their compliance with international law. And I would go into meetings with, you know, I don't know, the head of, uh, of internal security in a particular state. And I would talk about treaties. I would say, so I'm interested in learning how you're in compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And what I would get back was a bunch of soft law kind of blurb. Oh, we're in compliance with this guideline from the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Or we're implementing the FATF regulations. And I was like, oh, so what have I missed? And what I missed, or what I then internalized, was that actually soft law was kind of overtaking hard law in practice in national legal systems. And it's not unusual. We've got soft law in a lot of areas. It's not just counterterrorism. We see it in human rights law. We see it in environmental law. And generally, international lawyers have been pretty hot on the value of soft law. 
Counterterrorism law gives me some caution on soft law, and I want to talk about the unique features of this hard, hard law that's coming out of the Security Council, married with this soft but hard law that's coming out of a bunch of other places. So first of all, again, to go back to scale, we've seen this enormous proliferation of soft law standards. And they're coming from the most obscure bodies, like tech against terrorism. Anybody heard about tech against terrorism? Or the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which I used to think of as a fairly marginal little place where states just kind of talk to each other without much influence. But it turns out they produce a whole lot of soft law that in my view, after six and a half years of Special Rapporteur, is deeply shaping state practice. The second point is that soft law here is really hard. And so it's that that point that just as I was walking into meetings and I'm being talked back to with soft law, these officials and institutions at the national level don't see these things as optional. Or they see them as preferable to hard law, or they think they can swap out their hard law obligations for these softer, uh, more um, security protective standards. Third, most of this soft law has no human rights content. To say that it's human rights light is kind of a, is a, is, is a disservice to the diet version of human rights that we see in lots of places, right? It's incredibly light. One of the reasons it's so light is that most of the places that it's produced in, whether that's the Global Counterterrorism Forum or the Shanghai Framework Agreement or the Financial Action Task Force are places that human rights experts do not ever have access. As UN Special Rapporteur, I would knock at those doors and I would occasionally get invited in, but never consistently and never with the kind of standing that I have as a UN entity in other UN places. So if you're a state and you don't like human rights experts and you certainly don't like civil society, where are you going to choose to go for your norm development? You're not going to go to the place where you're going to have to deal with a whole bunch of experts telling you how what you want to do it violates human rights. You're going to go to somewhere else where actually there's a great group think about why these measures work better than others. And in fact, something like the Global Counterterrorism Forum, established by the United States and by Turkey way back in 2011, was expressly set up to move around what we're seeing as the kind of barriers to quick implementation on security issues uh, that the US was identifying at that time in the UN system. The fourth thing I would say about soft law is that unlike many other places, because, as I'll talk about next, there is a UN and global architecture of counterterrorism, soft law doesn't live in a vacuum in counterterrorism. It has pathways to implementation. It has a huge, which I'll talk about in a minute, UN architecture of counterterrorism, but it has all of these other places and access points at national level that the soft law of the environment or the soft law of human rights just simply doesn't have. So it's just a different level of game. And so what I want to say is you've got these things working in tandem, and what all of that is doing is fundamentally undermining our core treaty and customary law systems. And I've talked about that at length to the General Assembly. Most states do not want to change this status quo because it works really well for them. All right, let me move to institutions. So again, Post 9-11, the world changes not just in terms of where the norms come from, what they have, and where human rights is embedded in, but actually the other thing that this Security Council Resolution 1373 does is it creates a new architecture at the UN. So everybody knows the Security Council, but what most people don't know is that after 9-11 and UN Security Council Resolution 1373, something called the Counterterrorism Committee gets created at the UN Security Council. It sits right below the Council. And again, I just want to you know, compare and contrast. People say the Security Council is dysfunction. 
But actually, if you just go one step down, same member states sitting in the formation of the Counterterrorism Committee, enormous amounts of, anonym, of, of, of unanimity. Great, actually, I mean, if we were to see it as a model of sort of action, it's a really good model of action. They've been quite effective. They also have a permanent civil service supporting them through something called a, a special political mission. It's like a, a little task force appended to them called UN CTED. And again, this gives counterterrorism something that nobody else has on the Security Council. It gives it a pathway and an accountability mechanism because states have to report to the CTC. And by the way, those reports are secret. Nobody gets to see them after 2006. So you don't, if I issue a report, if the Human Rights Committee issues a report, they're public. The counterterrorism reports, never public. Guess what happens? State reports regularly and on time to the, to the UN Counterterrorism Committee. And, and none of us, well, I, I get to see it as UN confidential, a special rapporteur, but I can never talk about it in public. So if I see a gap between my report on a country and what the UN uh, Counterterrorism Committee has said, I have no way functionally to expose that. It's designed. This isn't a flaw. This is a purposeful design in the system. So in addition to this architecture at the Security Council, we also have the fastest growing part of the UN is counterterrorism. We have something called the Counter Office of Counterterrorism, uh, which was established in 2017, which consolidates all of the work of the UN on counterterrorism. So if you thought counterterrorism was receding post 9-11, just look at the first reform that the Secretary General makes in 2017. It's to create this, like, it's like a Rolls Royce new office in the UN system. They have more money than they know what to do with. Anybody want to guess who funds them? Pick a state. Actually not. It would think we would we we do, but we don't. The single largest funder of the Office of Counterterrorism is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The second largest funder is the Kingdom of Qatar. And so if we look at who pays for counterterrorism at the UN, this will help us understand why the structure of counterterrorism is both well funded. And this brings us back to the problem of funding for human rights. States pay for what they want. And when they want something, they'll pay for it really well. So we have 44 member entities, of which I was one in New York in the Global Counterterrorism Compact. And this is one of the pathways that distributes soft, creates soft law, distributes soft law, and consolidates and expands UN uh, work in counterterrorism. And one of my major beefs is that this, uh, this structure, which last year was one of the few, got 50 new positions in the UN. 50 new positions. That's like the kind of heart that went on the regular budget, and it means it's with us it's, it's sort of like uh, plutonium. It's not going to go away. You create those systems, they don't leave. And one of my major challenges, a special rapporteur, which I did not win this argument with the Secretary General, and I didn't win it with member states when they negotiated the counterterrorism uh, uh, strategy last year, is that we need a seriously pruned architecture of counterterrorism. This bloated growth of counterterrorism in the UN system, driven by the imperatives of a small number of states, is distorting what the real challenges are, which is the prevention of violence. And the prevention of violence at national level is extremely complex. But if you call everything terrorism, then you have a single tool to deal with it. And the truth is you don't deal with it very well. In addition to this massive UN architecture, there's also been this extraordinary growth of uh, I would say, regional architectures of counterterrorism. The Organization of American States has its own counterterrorism architecture. The European Union has a special office on counterterrorism. The 
um, um, the Council of Europe, which we think of as primarily a human rights organ, has its own counterterrorism committee. And that's just, I would say, democratic states. If we look a little further afield and we look at something like the Shanghai Framework Agreement, which has been led by China and Russia, and the way in which the Shanghai Framework Agreement re-envisages bilateral and multilateral spaces around security dictates, this isn't a peripheral problem for the integrity of international law. It's a fundamental kind of challenge to the multilateral system, dressed up in the language of security, which is a little bit like motherhood and apple pie. You can't say it's a bad thing. It just turns out that the misuse of those structures, frameworks, language is having this extraordinarily negative effect on the rule of law globally, on the protection of human rights, and on the integrity of our existing international legal order. So, as I close in the last five minutes, having sort of set out some of these challenges institutionally and normatively, I want to say a little bit about where these flawed approaches, some of which were hardwired in in 2001, some of which have just grown pace and developed over the last two decades, is shows us that we, we are so fundamentally on the wrong path. The empirical evidence that I, as Special Rapporteur, but many other, including UN treaty bodies, have demonstrated is that the playbook of counterterrorism has not made us safer, and it has certainly not advanced the protection of human rights. The evidence we have on the success of this adventure over the last two decades is profoundly negative. And I want to use one example, which is the example of the Sahal region in North Africa. Um, the Sahal was identified as a, a context in which there was a significant danger of counter -terror of terrorism. Mali, a country I visited just two and a half years ago, maybe illuminates the challenges more than anywhere else. Mali has multiple challenges, but the way in which that <clears throat> problem was identified was a problem that said Mali's major problem is a terrorism problem. And so, led by the G5 Sahel, what we saw was this enormous investment of cash into Mali to, quote, do counterterrorism. And it came strings free. It came with no oversight of the security sector, no guarantees on governance, and a blind eye to the human rights violations that were being committed in the name of countering terrorism. The result was scalar human rights violations, alienation of local groups, further splintering of governance. When I visited Mali two and a half years ago, I couldn't go anywhere but in an armored carrier. I couldn't go outside of Bamako. There actually, after all of the money that's been poured into Mali, there isn't a single functioning road into Bamako, even from the airport. And what we saw then happening, literally, as I was, I, I won't correlate my visit with the rise of Wagner. That would be a little, that, that's not what I'm saying. But what we saw in that, in that moment was as the West became, the G5 Sahel members became increasingly concerned about the scale of human rights violations. Um, the military in Mali did not like the pressure they were on, under. And what they did was, they essentially, they overthrew the democratically elected state and they went to other customers to give them the security supplies and guarantees that they wanted, which included primarily the Wagner Group and Russia. And so there we have an investment in counterterrorism, entirely human rights free, oversight free, a failure to look at the complexity of what was driving violence in Mali, which was fundamentally about a failure of governance, a failure to deliver for the, uh, for the people of Mali. And that to me is illustrative too by places like Afghanistan, where actually, where not that anybody wants to sit down and do an analysis of what went wrong, but what went wrong was partly two decades of ill-conceived counterterrorism, which created the conditions conducive for the Taliban to return. So what do we need? Well, going forward, we need to do 
<coughs> something profoundly different. We need a fundamental shift in national and global approaches. We need to name the misuse of counterterrorism. <clears throat> we need to imagine alternative approaches to counterterrorism that will shift both national and global approaches. And what that really has to do is address the complex uh, reasons for entrenched violence in society. I grew up in a violent society in Belfast, and I can tell you that counterterrorism was not the resolution of conflict. Uh, bases in Northern Ireland. I profoundly believe that we need a downsizing of the existing global and national counterterrorism institutions and architectures. We need to end legal exceptionalism that enables these systems to function at domestic level without accountability. We need actually to address um, a, the actors, many of them currently labeled as terrorists, and do complex things, which we had to do in Ireland, which is to talk to them, to understand why and how the violence has occurred and how to prevent it in the future. This means we need to fundamentally rethink what we mean by threat in national security terms. And we have to address the conditions that produce violence. And to my mind, everywhere I've been, what that means is uh, and what that what actually produces violence are deep rule of law deficits, um, a lack of judicial independence, a failure of social systems to provide for individual and community needs, a disenfranchisement of the population from economic social uh, uh, benefits, and poverty, insecurity, a lack of investment in marginalized communities. We say these things but we do nothing about them structurally. And none of what I say about causalities is new. Everybody probably knows these things are true. But unless we are ready to have the hard conversations on the failures of counterterrorism and to fundamentally grapple with causes con conducive, not only are we likely to end up in these enduring cycles of violence that we've seen in so many other places, but we will continue to embolden, facilitate a legal and institutional architecture that is going to gnaw away at the core of our, uh, our rule of law and human rights architectures. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, we have about a little less than 20 minutes for questions. Yeah, I see Mara. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is um, brilliant. So I wanted to push you more a little bit on possible ways forward. Um, yes. So um, fully agree with you that um, we need some way of downsizing this um, counterterrorism infrastructure that is really sort of outlived the need for it. Um, what do you think are the alternative paradigms that the UN or maybe other states might be able to get excited about funding? Could that be transitional justice or resilience or the peace and development nexus? It seems like there will need to be something. We yeah. need to be able to argue um, that uh, you provide an alternative paradigm that will address some of these root causes. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I think many of us have been making the economic, so one argument to make, and I, I think we, I don't want to not be imaginative, but I think I would start, and I often start with states, with the value for money argument. Like, really? If you were asking, if you were spending this money anywhere else, you would be asking for monitoring and evaluation. You would be asking for simple, the value proposition of where you're spending your money. And so one of the things that's fundamentally true about the UN counterterrorism, but also regional counterterrorism efforts, is they come without any M&E, like literally none. So I actually want to start there. And I think we've been successful there in the sense that the new global counterterrorism strategy, which was agreed last year, for the first time includes these M&E requirements. And I, I, I don't suggest that technically fixes everything, but I think it's quite revealing. If you're spending your money on this, and like you spent all this money in the G5 Sahel, and what did you get? You got Wagner and a military coup. Like That's a bad return on investment. Um, 
But I hear you totally on the second point, which is where do we go for a new kind of consensus? And I think, you know, the Secretary General is trying hard. We have the negotiation of a new agenda for peace right now. And that would seem to me to be a really important place for states to actually focus their efforts on actually updating, reinvigorating, and reimagining the peace architecture of the United Nations. So that's a really key place. My fundamental worry is that the counterterrorism folks are eyeing up the peace architecture like a juicy steak, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to get in there and eat it all up. So one of the things we have to do is actually safeguard peace from commodification by counterterrorism, and then do this move. It's really hard right now. Nobody has bandwidth for anything other than crisis management in the UN. The second place, which is old and, and tired but true, is the SDGs. <laughs> Got to implement this. We have to envelop, in, in, implement the sustainable development goals. These are the markers against which people's basic needs are met and violence has some chance of being diminished, right? So those are the two places where we are now that I think states have to re-envisage and reaffirm their efforts. Yeah. Right at the back. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. This was really, really interesting. Um, I will say that this is not exactly my area, but what, what I thought was really interesting is that you started with Guantanamo. Um, and I'm curious to know, if, I, I know you were talking about like a lot of this um, benefit authoritarian regime, yeah. but do you find that counterterrorism as like, a funding source um, as you know, really as an opportunity in the UN, does it kind of function also as relatively performative and expressive, mm. right? Like, you know, you have um, yeah. countries that are utilizing it to like further maybe, I don't know, to use like a very US-centered example, oh, it's an election year, we want to look tough on foreign policy, so yeah. let's, use foreign, let's use counterterrorism to further our personal goals and our yeah. global ones. No, it's a super important point, and I, I do want to acknowledge, like, Guantanamo hasn't gone away. We have 30 men. When I visited, there were 34 men detained. There are now 30, 16 of whom have been cleared by the PRB. There's no, the United States has decided through its legal processes that there's no legal basis to hold these men. But we've also passed legislation in Congress that doesn't allow the United States to transfer anybody to Yemen, Somalia, or Afghanistan. So you have 16 men with nowhere to go who are being held, in my view, arbitrarily and in violation of international law. And their continued uh, detention in that category of detention reaches the threshold for torture, inhuman, and degrading treatment under international law. And Guantanamo is a blight on the United States. It is inconceivable that you continue to hold men that you have said are not a threat to national security, have done no wrong, should be returned home, and remain incarcerated, many of them, for 20 The oldest detainee still there, first detainee transferred, Moath Alalahi, who's an extraordinary artist, a boat builder. I encourage you to look up um, the images that, he has, uh, that he's been able to share through his lawyers. Still held, not released. So that's, that's just a mobilization that I think, particularly for young law students, that might seem like a long time ago, but that is so present, so important, uh, and shouldn't be forgotten. But your point about expression is 100% right. This performs, the language of counterterrorism is performative. The use of the word terrorist is a performative choice as much as it is a category. In general, for the mandate for me as a scholar, I use the word terrorist acts because there you have a certainty of a specific kind of action to which you can hold someone accountable. But the language of terrorism itself is functioning to strip whole peoples of their, of their protections under international law. Um, and I, I, I think we, we need to interrogate hold states accountable for the kind of misuse of the terminology and, and, and like deliberately say those words are not the words we want to hear. They're not the words, they shouldn't be doing the work they do upon us. Yeah. Yes, go. Professor, absolutely spectacular presentation. I really enjoyed it. Disagree with you a little bit on some of the things about Guantanamo, but uh, it seems like we have a little bit of a chicken and egg problem sense of in order to do the things we want to do in countries we have to have security
Mm-hmm. And to get security, you have to do things in wartime that you would not want to do in, in mm-hmm. this time. Uh, how do you think we might want to think about that? And, uh, and have you ever read uh, uh, Jackie Hazelman's book? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I just start at a very different position on that language of security because I think what, and I think we have an enormous problem of kind of a security think about how we think about what is the threat. And how I see it in the UN Security Council, for example, when the 1267 Al-Qaeda Committee reports and they talk about threat in these highly narrow ways. So there's this number of attacks, there's this number of people moving, there's this group that seems to be connecting with this group. Those are not irrelevant, but what they miss is context. They are entirely devoid, in many cases, of that kind of deep contextual. So they don't do a good service to actually giving the kind of grounded security assessment that goes beyond a kind of a narrow version of uh, acts of terrorism. And I think that leads me to the point about human security as the basis for doing threat assessment, not narrow security frames that have driven both national and international. Um, and that's a hard, because the, the proposition when you start in a different place, you know, there's a joke in Ireland that when you ask somebody for directions, they say, oh, but I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always my feeling in counterterrorism. I, I don't, but you're in the wrong place to be starting. The, yeah, like in Mali, where are we now starting that conversation? The conversation which the dogs on the street could have told you in Mali in 2014 was that actually, yes, you have this problem of fighters that emerge post the collapse of Libya, and you have these kind of, but actually the major problem in Mali is the state's capacity to deliver for its population. And if you can do that, you're going to hold off on these other things. So I just think we need a much different aperture. And the, the, the language, it hasn't, like, go back, has any of this work? Where are we in Afghanistan? Oh, well, 20 years later, we're back with the same guys that we thought we were going to take out running Afghanistan, more or less. <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. Again, that's, this is the point. Not yet. And it's that failure, like, that's the short-term problem, where it's all about, well, what's happening now? Well, play that out 10 years in that region would be my question. Yeah. Yeah, here. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I have a question about the soft law. Yeah. You notice there's any difference that uh, upon the soft laws that were produced in different platforms? You mm. mentioned about the terrorism yeah, yeah. forum and yeah. some kind of framework. Yeah. And does such a difference impact yeah. the implementation of the soft law in domestic countries? Super good question. Really interesting question. <laughs> So soft law has posed, in the, I'm just going to talk about the counterterrorism space, has posed different kinds of problems for different kinds of states. So take a country like Switzerland, where actually we, there was a legal challenge to the Swiss highest court about the implementation of any kind of soft law within the Swiss national legal system. So some states pushed back, and more, more specifically their judiciaries and their legal systems, pushed back at the absorption of soft law. Other states are far more porous, meaning it doesn't pose a formal legal problem to sort of ground national policy or practice. I would also observe in the soft law space that I think that, so maybe this is a slight diversion, but a lot of the work of counterterrorism isn't happening in the criminal law anymore. It's happening in other spaces. I see it happening in administrative law. I see it happening in civil law spaces. So, for example, things like listing somebody on a watch list or, um, again, it's not a criminal measure, but it's actually, it functions in actually much of the same way. So I think of six Palestinian human rights organizations that were listed uh, uh, over a year ago. And, um, I mean... It's not, they haven't been criminally sanctioned, but listing has effectively made it almost impossible for these organizations, 
to function, including the women's committee that runs women's shelters in the occupied Palestinian territory. So again, what do we get from the dissemination of civil society using this measure? We get, I think, actually very bad outcomes. And to go back, that's, that's sort of a, both a hard and a soft measure in different ways, hard internationally, but also hard and soft playing off in different ways domestically. And um, I mean, the final sort of reflection, I would say, on soft law is I see an increasing sort of path of soft to hard, right? So these things are, things start off as soft and they move to hard law. So the, and, and the progress, there isn't like a universal answer on that question. But across legal systems, I'm seeing that pathway emerge. And I, I think as scholars and practitioners, we need to be doing a better job of tracing it. Because I actually think, and I, I, I say this as a critique of my own, like as an international lawyer, I, I sort of knew what to do with the hard law I knew what to do with. But then I found myself in this universe where actually soft and hard is intermingled and, and navigating it state by state. I just don't think we have very good blueprints on in practice. And it's just something that, yeah, that I think we need to do more on. Yes, go. Um, my question is, you talk about like, the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals. How do we move to implement those goals? Because I think, you know, if we look at like Iraq and Afghanistan, the U.S. and its allies attempted to engage in like nation building, institution building, and that was unsuccessful. Yeah. Or you look at Gaza and like the U.N. Relief and Worker, Works Agency. Mm. You know, there's been an attempt to build institutions, schools, you know, other things to help build the population up. And a lot of the time, those resources end up being funneled into terrorism even mm. further. And so I wonder how we, how do we actually make sure that, like, how do we build a nation when we're dealing with these challenges? And then how do we, you know, talking to terrorists, if their goal, you know, is not, oh, we're unhappy that there's poverty here, but their goal is truly, like, something that, you know, we as an international community cannot allow. How do we deal with those things? Yeah, there's a host of super interesting questions in there, like who do we talk to? I mean, my view is we pretty much have to, I mean, I was part of a peace negotiation where we negotiated with people who spent 20 years blowing up the, the, the community I lived in, including people I love. So, yeah, we, we have to talk to people that not just fundamentally agree, disagree with us, may want to do harm to us. And I, 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 people will say we never talk to terrorists. And I want to tell you that is the rule most broken in international law. Everybody talks to everybody, whether it's non-state armed groups or it's states we don't like. Um, I was in Syria this summer. Um, Syria is in, under sanction. And if you look at sort of one set of Western narratives about Syria, nobody's talking to Syria. Oh, but let's be clear. Everybody's talking to Syria, more or less if not directly, in other ways. So I think we have to rid ourselves of the notion that there are like these lines are absolute. Unfortunately, th th that can cause all kinds of, I would say, principled and other challenges. But I think we, talk, we have to talk to everybody. I think the second thing we, we do on the sustainable development goals, it's really hard. Like, to go back to, um, you know, um, the question about like how to get states excited, Nobody's excited about technical implementation. Everybody wants a shiny, bright object. And the things that we know work well are things that take a really long time. A really long time. Like 7, 10. In Ireland, we finally, this week, got our first functional government in a peace agreement that is like 30 years old. So anybody who thinks there's a quick solution on any of this, like we're in the wrong business, because it's not. It's slow, painful, complex work, and you'll have more failure than you have success. It's like, it doesn't go like this, it goes like this, and you have to just stick it out. And so to go back, we actually need a commitment to unsexy things over the long term. That's what we need. And we don't, we don't have to get excited about that, but we have to have a principled position that that's what we do. And I would also just say on the, on the question of, um, like, how do we deal with the complexity of violence and security? Yes, it is very difficult to provide security in complex conflict environments. 
But we have an obligation, for example, under international humanitarian law, to provide humanitarian assistance in every conflict. And yes, some of that will get diverted. But the cost of starvation or famine for a population, whether that's Sudan or Gaza or, um, or elsewhere, is just unacceptable. It's, it, it is a on the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration and the Genocide Convention, Again, it goes back to like principles. There are principled things we have to have a commitment to over the long term. And someone like me is also deeply pragmatic because I, I think the way to end violence is to solve conflict. And the place that I come from, that's just not a short-term proposition. It's, it's multi-generational propositions. And the challenge is that the international community and many states have short memories and an unwillingness to do that hard work. Yeah, but really good question. Yeah, so questions. Unfortunately, the time we have, but please join me in thanking you.